So where are you at today? Um, I am right outside of D.C. in Rockville, Maryland. I actually, I grew up in Northern Virginia. Uh, my wife and three kids and I are in Rockville, Maryland. Rockville, Maryland, home mm-hmm. of the Geyer family as well as OAR. Oh, is that true? That is that is true. Mark Roberge and uh, wow. and the group OAR. Are you? Uh, I mean, they're a baseball friendly band. Yeah, I like them. Um, I, so them, uh, Wale. The rapper Wale is okay. kind of close here. Um, I believe he went to Quince Orchard High School around here. I actually walked out to his songs when I played. So, okay. um, yeah, that's so, awesome. so you're you're, re- you're rep in Maryland, Northern rep in Maryland. You know, I'm a Virginia guy. I, um, I crossed over the river about 12 years ago. Um, okay. But rep in, I like to say the DMV, DC, Maryland, Virginia. Okay. All right. You know, like like I'm from New York, and like when us New York guys cross over into Jersey, it's like a weird thing. I don't know. How, <laughs> I don't know how it is down in your area with the, with the crossing over that river. It was weird at first, but I, I'm used to it by now. But it yeah, was you, definitely weird. I got some got some stuff from my friends for sure. Um, yeah, so it's it, it's a big move. But uh, anyway, I I caught your interview that you did a couple of weeks ago with MLB Network, and I I enjoyed it. I watched it a, a couple of times. I watched it with my wife. There were some things in there that that you said that caught that caught my attention. I I enjoyed hearing about your journey and how you dealt with the pressures of the journey. And I just thought it would be very helpful for a lot of people um, to hear, you know, for a guy like you, even a guy like me that's coached big leaguers my whole career, you being one, um, you know, you're used to being around high performing individuals. You're used to being in these environments where it's like, win, 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 do whatever it takes. There's discipline. There's a schedule. This is when I train. This is when I eat. This is when I this is when I do all the things I need to do in order to be ready for, you know, seven o'clock during the week and 1 PM on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Uh, For you, the first question I have is a, how have you adapted to life outside of the big leagues? Yeah, well, you're spot on with all that and and great question. Um, So basically my, my entire uh, well, I guess I got to go back real quick. My first three years at, at high school in Herndon, Virginia struggled mightily and, and it was all the mental side of the game. So diet zero scholarships after my junior year. So, um, then I dove into the mental side of the game, read different books and, and all that stuff just really went deep. Um, and then I saw the, the change it made in my life and my career and also what it has for many athletes, as you know, and individuals, they don't have to be athletes. Um, when it comes to the mindset and mental performance or mental strength, whatever you want to call it. So then ever since then, I I just became obsessed with it. So then when I, you know, to get back to your question, when I retired, I had already known what I wanted to do. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. So the transition and and all that has been, you know, fairly smooth, Um, you know, obviously miss playing and all that stuff, but I'm almost having as much fun as I did when I was playing. Um, But as you know, the the mental stuff it, it translates to any domain no matter what we're doing um so it made that transition easier whether starting my business having the discipline um to get things done um time management energy management um all that stuff was already there cuz i had already built that foundation when i played so it made that transition a lot easier um and man just having a lot of fun doing it yeah, no, it's cool. It's 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 rewarding. You know, it's a little bit different. You know, I got to ask you this because, you know, I've come across a lot of players through the years that they do get their hands on those books and they start digging in and some of them respond really well mm. and others actually start to overanalyze. Maybe it's their personality mm. and they actually start to, you know, they, they kind of screw themselves a little bit. They get so mm-hmm. deep in it that it almost paralyzes them. How did you mm. balance a taking in the information, but still remaining in flow and allowing your natural talent and abilities to to really dominate and and step forward yeah so i like to think there's no the way we're all wired so differently like every player has to find their way and i guess i was fortunate and maybe not fortunate that i worked with some mental uh skills coaches during my career that, that did what you just said i felt like I would go out there and I would overthink things. Um, but then I was also fortunate to work with some great ones that it's kiss, keep it simple stud. Like that's mm-hmm. all I was thinking. Um, and that's their mindset. And that's my mindset with everything I do now. I, I'll first session with an athlete. I say, Hey, 
I'm trying to give you a toolbox, a compete toolbox to compete with all you have every single pitch in the present moment, but you find your way through trial and error. I'm never going to tell you, you got to do it this way. We are literally all wired so differently. So the players you're talking about, yeah, some of them, when they read a book and they try to apply things and they do too much, hey, that's not for them. But for some players, it can be very beneficial. Um, and I always like to say, you know, players can read books and, and do listen to podcasts or whatever it is. Um, you know, a lot of times, though, without taking action and applying everything, it's like you become a librarian. You just store it up here. But we got to be warriors. We got to go onto the field and we got to take action. We got to apply everything or it just stays up here. You're that librarian of knowledge and nothing happens. So it is a fine line. But, man, there's no the way. You just got to find through trial and error what works best for each individual player is kind of how I would answer that. All right. So you said you got to go out and be a warrior out on the field. Mm -hmm. This is when I just, I'm just thinking, and if you tell someone, Hey, you got to be a warrior out there again, mm -hmm. the individual interprets that each individual interprets that in their own way. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you advise if you're going to coach somebody and advise them to say, Hey, I want you to be a warrior out there. And then all of a sudden you see them tense up and they, and they associate warrior with gladiator mm. and they, they tense up, they puff up. Like, how do you help somebody not interpret it as such? Like, what is a warrior? And you, like, if you're, if I'm going to tell you to go out and play like a warrior, what does that mean to you? And, and what does mm -hmm. it look like? So when I say warrior, I just mean kind of the opposite of being a librarian, like get all these, the tools, the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the librarian just keeps it here and doesn't apply and try to turn it into a skill and a tool that's going to benefit them. A warrior by warrior, I just mean you apply everything. I don't mean literally like be that warrior on the field. I was, I mean, it can be in it. I love that word. Um, but when I talk about warrior, I like to think of it, you can be a victim or you can be a warrior. That's literally one of the milestones we talk about. Mm. Be that victim, why me, blame others, complain, um, all that stuff, or be that warrior, good, Jocko Willing style, good, good. What do I need to do to get what I want when things don't go uh, my way? So when I'm talking about warrior, I really just meant more so just applying everything we're going over rather than just keeping it up here. But that victim versus warrior mindset, I think, is the absolute, not the most important, but one of the most important. You know, we've all, especially at our worst times, we, don't, we fall in that victim mindset when things don't go our way. But if you can catch yourself and flip real quick to that creator, to that hero, to that warrior who really just at, what do I need to do to get what I want? Then things start to come our way. And then we show up with this uh, you know, fierce intensity with commitment and with discipline. And then whatever you want to call it, the life force around us, um, the universe, soul force, that thing, love, whatever you call that thing that's bigger than us loves when we show up with that fierce intensity. Um, so long way of me saying that's kind of what I think of when I'm thinking of a warrior. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I want to take you back to your, your playing days, which weren't, it's not that far back, but you know, what were some of the mental states or emotions that you dealt with, you know, as a player, what would you say are some of the recurring themes that you had to overcome? Yeah. Um, hmm. So a lot of the, the obstacles that I think that many, just about all athletes and I think individuals in general, and, you know, I'm curious if you would agree, fear worry, doubt, stress, uncertainty, um, anxiety, all yeah. of those mental obstacles we all put in our ways, right? And and dealing with that in those first three years in high school, and even as we as I continue to go on, it was there. But now, you know, myself and you know, athletes who train the mental side of the game now have something to go to. But as a, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, it's still going to be challenging when you're on that true journey to be great, call it a hero's journey or whatever you want to call it, it's going to be challenging. <laughs> uh, so having these skills and tools to really handle those challenging times, anxiety, fear, fear of failure, uh, fear of not being perfect, all that stuff. Those were all very present during my career on and off the field. Um, and it's really just developing the tools and the courage to act in the presence of that fear, knowing we all have it, but very few have the mindset to really act in the present, have that courage to um, not let it really take over you. Yeah, no, it's true. It's, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, my years of surveying, you know, big leaguers, I, I I seldom saw guys really talk about the, you know, what they were dealing with 
on the on the mental side of the game. Like you didn't really hear too much dialogue mm-hmm. around it. it mm-hmm. You know, you for me, I always saw beha- like some behavior changes that I can pick up on. It may even be like, you know, hey, I'm, they're going to come see me a bit more to train physically because they were dealing with some sort of mental um, issue, you know, where it's mm. like, Hey, I'm, I'm not playing well. And I have this doubt that I work hard enough. Oh, I'm not sure. Let me go train. But mm. you know, for you, if we were to sort of like give people real life, Hey, this is something I dealt with. What, what would, what would be one thing that you felt yourself having to like constantly work on? Or was there anything? Yeah. Um, great question. So, um, I'll talk about a couple of things. So one was, um, the yips when I played, um, Mm. so some people don't know what those are, by the way. Yeah. So the yips are basically as a baseball player, it's hell, throw the ball. (laughs) It's, it's hell. Yeah. You don't know where it's going. Um, for whatever. So basically I had, um, stitches, I broke this finger and had stitches, um, put in the, my middle finger, uh, in 2000 and I think it was 13. Okay. Right before I kind of stuck in the big leagues, I was going to bunt a ball and the ball hit my finger. And then coming back from that, I remember making one, a couple of throws down in Durham with the Durham bulls and that brutal, like way off. And I just like, I didn't have really much, um, much feel or grip. It was like kind of numb right there. So I didn't feel it. So then it just, I, even though I've been training all this mental skill stuff, it just got in my head and I had never dealt with that before. So dealing with that was a challenge. And then getting to the big leagues, like one of the tough, toughest things and most anxious times of my day was warming up with Desmond Jennings or warming up with Kevin Kiermeyer. If they're in center field, I'm in left field or right field, throwing 20, 30 feet to them. I'd be overthrowing them. I'd be bouncing the ball to them. And actually in Tampa with the turf, it actually made it a little bit easier because I could just one hop them sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Through. Um, but dealing with that and in my head, I'm like, oh my God, fans here, they're in their head. They're like, oh my God, this big leaguer came and throw it 20 feet to a person's chest. Like a little leaguer could do that. So I was starting to think about all that. So then visualization helped with that my self-talk getting to the point where what I wanted to see happen rather than what I didn't want to see happen, get an external. Mm. There's no secret. Uh, there really is no secret for the getting over the yips. I mean, that it's a challenging thing. And trust me, I've talked with some high level guys in the big leagues. It's a bigger problem than many people talk about. They don't want yeah. to mention it, especially when they, when they're playing, I didn't mention it when I was playing, I'm fine talking about it now. Yeah. Um, but it's a crazy weird thing. It's, um, and then it's, it's very, it's, it's really, it's a really weird thing. Did you it's having to see Rick Ankiel's documentary that. Where he I, I didn't see it? the documentary, but check, I know it's story. Yeah. Check, check it out. It's pretty cool. How they, how they cinematize it, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. So basically, I guess that's part of fear. But the other one was just like fear and, um, and nervousness, not really knowing how to handle it when I was younger. Um, and, you know, I get in the box or on deck or in the box when it's a big at bat or be on defense, hoping the ball's not hit to me because I didn't want to, you know, cost the team the game or, you know, make that mistake or get embarrassed. So having those emotions, but it was all, I was more so looking at it like a threat to my life, a threat to my identity, thinking my career might be over. Whereas really when I was finally taught, it's all about how we perceive it and looking at it like that challenge. So you can have that, you know, free and loose response. And really five of the most important words that I ever learned in my life was, I'm excited, bring it on. So the I'm excited part is when I'm feeling, or any athlete, any individual before a big speech or a big test, whatever we're doing, important conversation with a loved one or really anybody, we're going to have those nerves and high arousal in our body. And so I was taught and learned that, um, you know, how we perceive it and look, oh, fear and excitement is the same thing in our body. So if we look at it like, oh, thank you, body you're priming me to perform. I'm really excited. I'm not nervous. I'm not scared. That was huge. And then the three words that, you know, I have it written on this wristband. And I I like to tell athletes three most powerful words we could ever say to ourselves, bring it 
on. This is what I train for. Bring it on. I want this moment. And then you just go into it with this win or learn mindset. And then the pressure melts away. And instead of being tense and tight, like I used to always be when I was younger, you're now free and loose because it's win or learn. And you're taking all that energy and using it to propel you rather than that obstacle that's really in your way. So that's really quick to answer um, the question of what I dealt with during my career. All right. So real cool. I love like you know, you talked about energy, you know, that like that energy, either it, it gets you nervous, right? You can get some kind of, it, it gets, that's what gets you nervous. It gets you crazy. But mm-hmm. all of a sudden, I feel like when you said, bring it on, it's like the visual I had was channeling that energy towards, instead of it swirling and just causing internal chaos in your mm-hmm. gut, in your head, sweaty mm-hmm. palms all over the place. It's like, okay, let me channel it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me channel it. And, and by the way, I remember, I'll share this with you. I remember um, I was in, Carl Pavano just got traded to the to the Yankees from the Marlins. And he calls me and he says, hey, can we train together? So we go in New York City and we, and, and we go into this gym, gymnasium, real tight. And we start playing catch. And all of a sudden I throw that one ball and it just sailed right. Didn't think much of it. Get the ball back, throw it again. It sails even further right. There's like a kid's day camp going on over there. Uh-huh. All of a sudden, pfft, I can't throw the ball. So I know, yeah. I know what you're saying, and it's like that feeling, like the yips. It's it is like it's 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 demonic in a way. It just takes over your your whole being. Mm-hmm. And uh, to, so to to get over it and to mm-hmm. use these tools, and not mm-hmm. only that, to get over it and get to the highest level of the sport is pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. That is, I mean that that validates a lot of your mental mental tools. And mental training, I would think. Yeah, and, and dude, thank God, thank the good Lord, I had been training this stuff kind of leading up to that. Because um, if not, it, dude, that could have just ruined my career. Because it really started happening right as I got to the big leagues. Um, so, and yeah. there were other times during my career, but dude, back in um, 2009, my first year in Double A. Um, after 200 at bats, I'm hitting 190. I'm playing with Ryan Sandberg. He was a manager with the Double um, A Tennessee Smokies, yeah. and I- I'm playing. F- I'm the first base coach for that first half, more than I was ever playing on the field, just because I was so brutal when I played. And so, and that was a time I was still all in training the mindset. But it just goes to say what I said earlier: like it's not supposed to be easy. It's still going to be challenging. But because I had those tools, I was able to. You know, the spiral went on for a long time, but I was able to finally catch it and spiral it back up. And and, and it just goes to show as life and life on and off the field, it's just part of the process of what we're doing. If you're really ch- ch- you know, chasing greatness or chasing mediocrity, there's different stress and meaning for everything. Um, and that was just another instance where, hey, you know, moment you can look back on down the road. Yeah, I got through that. I can get through anything, you know. Yeah. Two, two things from that. As, as you, as you look back on it all now, I'm sure you gave a lot of um, meaning and thought to these moments that were just actually moments. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, as you, as you kind of look back on it all now, Mm -hmm. what's some of the, um, like, how have you deconstructed it? Like, how do you look at all that now? Like when you look at like all that, that happened, Mm-hmm. Like I know you could say, well, I was learning, but like, how do you, how do you actually like look at it? Like if you had to go back and do it now from the state that you're in now. Mm, great question. Um, well, well, one thing I, I try to get across, like when athletes are going through it in the moment, or I say it's after a bad game or whatever, this used to be me. I'm sure you've been there before all athletes. We bring that hammer and we shame ourselves. Oh, yeah. um, I, I think it's important. We first uh, and this guy, I guess, could answer your question. We we first bring that flashlight and shine it on, develop that awareness of what's working and what's not working. And then you bring a hammer, but that hammer is of discipline, is of taking action. It's not of shame. Um, so if I were to look back on mo- those moments, um, I would bring that flashlight to really think about get that virtue of curiosity. Hmm. What did I learn from it? What, why was it happening? Kind of thing. Um, really, just to cultivate that winner learn mindset. Um, but I like to think of it as ohms. Another mantra that's written on here: obstacles make me stronger. I, I try to get across to athletes like when this stuff happens that is inevitable on and off the field. 
say thank you universe you're giving me something right now to literally make me stronger if you approach it that way so i would look back on all of those situations as ohms and i like to add an l in there ohms obstacles literally make me stronger and and now it's given me um ammo it's given me experience it's given me wisdom because i've been in there so these players i'm working with i've been in their shoes so i know what it's like knowing everyone's wired differently, but I I can try to give them everything that worked for me and other athletes and what mental skills coaches taught me yeah. to try to help them stop that spiral and then, you know, spiral back up. So, yeah, no, it's cool, man. I, I found it interesting though, what you said before, how here you are in the big leagues on the field, right? Again, at the highest level that one could get to, and you're saying, I hope the ball's not hit to me or, <laughs> you know, like, those are, those are real thoughts. And, and that's yeah. what I think a lot of people, um, that when, when I either a talk to you or I work with people as well, I, I try, I want to know what, what's really happening. Like you've mm -hmm. got this facade and you look like a great ball player and a great big leaguer in your uni and you're ready to go, but like, what's actually going on in your dome. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and sometimes it's scary. Dude. Very, very, um, a funny story about that. So with my program on Sundays, I bring on former teammates and coaches and stuff. Um, so for class two of major league mindset about six months ago, or maybe longer, Brad Miller, he's with the Texas Rangers. Now I played with him for four years, with the yeah. Tampa Bay Rays or th three, maybe um, he, he came on and joined us. And he told a story when he was at Clemson um, in 2010, as a sophomore, he led the nation in airs and statistically the worst shortstop in the nation. Wow. And then as a junior, he won the Brooks Wallace Award for the top shortstop in the nation. And I knew this story. So I had Brad, what, what changed? What did, what did you change physically to go from the worst to the best and become, I think he was a first round supplemental pick or second round pick. And now he's going in his 10th year in the big leagues. He said, BG, all I changed was how I talked to myself. I literally, that sophomore year, it's what you just mentioned. I didn't want the, I would be on defense hoping the ball's not hit to me because I had that fear of failure. I didn't want to make a mistake, especially like a big ACC game. And yeah. then junior year, all I said was bring it on, hit the, I want the ball hit to me. And he said, his mantra was I'm a vacuum. And he would say literally before every pitch, vroom, vroom, I'm going to eat everything up. So it, the shift in mindset there is what helped him. And you're talking about a lot of players, even the big leagues, if they make an error or things aren't going good, they're going to have that thought and, you know, do, I hope the ball's not hit to me or like a playoff yeah. game. I don't want to be the one making an error, but we got to just really quickly reframe it. Uh, easier said than done, um, but we all were humans. Yeah. We have those thoughts, you know? Yeah. It's almost like um, you have to quickly reframe it and not buy into it emotionally. Mm -hmm. I feel like once you buy in emotionally, you're done. Dude, yes. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it's interesting when you were just telling his story, I was like, it just sounded like one year he was literally playing defense mentally. And then the next year he just decided to be an offensive on the attack player. Mm -hmm. And so that's had, the power of self-talk, man. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, it's funny that you said this. I, I, I don't know if you could see this, but I, I posted this today. I don't know if it's showing up on the screen. Can you see mm -hmm. that? Or not? And it just, yeah, it just says power. your thoughts, your thoughts are your power. Mm-hmm. 100% so, in our control. It's probably the only thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I just find when people get in a defensive posture and they get on their heels and it's it's easy defense and victim and all that it, it's it's a it's a negative strand. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm so, and dude, that's why uh you know, I, I brought up this this wristband a couple of times, basically seven mantras on here voted on by athletes like the ones that have really helped them in the moment. Yeah. Change how they talk to themselves and their thoughts like you're talking about, because you talk about power. You probably heard, you know, I got this from Mark Devine, former Navy SEAL. He talks about the two wolves. You know, uh, we're all bad all day, every day battling with those two wolves in our head. Good, bad, powerful, powerless, yep. empowering, disempowering, courageous, fearful. And it's all about which one you're feeding and which one you're starving. And you do that with your thoughts and with your self-talk. Um, so just taking control, um, it's going to bring that power about like what you just showed and yeah, self-talk, man, it's everything. You, you know that this is a, a second side to all that though. You know, I always like to say, well, what affects one's self-talk? You know, you think about a, a, like just big league travel. It's, it could be pretty exhausting, right? You're playing, mm -hmm. you're training, you're traveling. 
I have found one of the great inducers of mental stress to be f- physical fatigue. Mm. And it's often not not spoken about. But what as I as I go back in my journey, and, and I'm sure you know players like this too, maybe you're one of them. Like I think of the Jeters, I think of the Teixeiras, I think of, of players like Mariano and guys like that. And I'm like, these guys are always sleeping. Like they're <laughs> always in their room. They're always like, like just always resting yeah and i and as i think about the the mindsets of those players i'm like how did they always maintain sort of that dominant alpha offense-based mindset i'm like it's gotta have something to do with it because where are we at our weakest Mm -hmm. some something to think about how did you manage your energy during a during a a big league season because there's by the way in the world of business it's a lot today like sport it's like you're always playing. You're, the games just keep coming. How do you maintain mm-hmm. yourself? Mm-hmm. Dude, I love everything you just said. Talking that, that's amazing. <laughs> um, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think the our physiology drives our psychology way more than people think. Um, I ha- in in the program, I have a milestone. It's called dominate the fundamentals. And for me, you know, I and you probably agree, greatness is consistency with the fundamentals. I forget where I heard that quote a long time ago. Um, But these fundamentals are all about helping them become more energized than ever, become more mentally and physically fit than they've ever been. Um, And and it's how they eat, how they sleep, like you just talked about, which I think is the number one performance enhancer, how they train, how they breathe, and then really the foundation of it all, their overall self discipline. Yeah. Um, but the sleep part of it, man, is everything. Cause it's going to bring you, you, you know, we can talk about time management all we want. It's important. I believe energy management is yeah. more important because then you'll be better with your time and you'll be, have more deep work or whatever you, um, are doing. Um, you'll be more locked in and focused. But, um, another thing is modern science, like positive psychology has found that the number one virtue most highly correlated with people's, what they call flourishing or well-being is zest and zest is this another word for energy. Um, so we would all be smart to cultivate and develop that energy. And that's why we spend so much time on those fundamentals, fueling yourself like that, you know, high performance machine sleep, dude. I remember real quick. I know I'm kind of going on about this, but this is my favorite subjects right here. The phys- the physiology drives our psychology so much. Um, in 2011, with the Tampa Bay Rays, I was a rookie, and they brought in a sleep expert uh, from Stanford. And she was up until that point. I was always fascinated with just optimizing every ounce of God given ability that I had, and it wasn't talked about. I feel like a ton back then for whatever reason, or I just missed it. So she oh, came. It in. wasn't. It was still. It was. At, you know, all that stuff was just kind of getting started at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and now it's huge obviously which is great um but she came in and and talked to us and you know i I left that meeting okay i'm not just gonna out eat out breathe out train out recover out discipline the competition you know it's time to out sleep the competition and um that's something i really try to get across whether it's an athlete you know someone who works in the corporate world as you know it that sleep i always like to say like a great day today I heard this a long time ago. Great day today starts the night before. Do you have that rock solid PM routine that's going to get you a great night of sleep? Because man, I'm a different person when I'm in bed nine to 11 hours um, and with quality sleep as well, like cutting out electronics before bed, not Mm -hmm. eating, you know, all that stuff. Um, I'm sure you would agree the importance of sleep, like you mentioned with your and Tixera. Yeah. I got, well, I, even the other day, I, I call it pulling the emergency break. I had to pull the emergency break on myself because I'm like, here it is, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. I'm still on still on the idiot box, right? Using the phone and, and doing stupid stuff. So yeah. I put this, uh, I, I guess it's a setting where from 8 p.m. to 7 a.m., my phone basically goes dark. It's like a useless tool. So I I, I depowered it without actually turning it off. I just gave, I took all its power away and gave it back to myself. And, you know, you think about it, it's like how many time, how many other places in life do we, do we need to do that? I remember for myself, there was always like a lot of pride in not sleeping or, you know, mm-hmm. and I would be around all these high performers and I'm like, it never registered the sleep part until later. Mm-hmm. And you're like, dude, if you, if you just slept, 
<laughs> how much better would you have been just mentally or just in every part of your life? Yeah. And not just sleeping. I think taking naps was always looked at like yeah. not weak, weak, but like you're soft or you're not tough if you're taking naps, you know, but like yeah. dude, before a game, a nice power nap, or I think a great, you know, when I was in Cleveland, I'm sure just about every team now has a sleep room yeah. um, that players go to like a good solid nap or breath work, meditation, visualization. Yeah. It's going to work wonders and pay dividends come game time, especially, you know, all the, I think these players do before a game. Okay. Can you then quiet it and just like recharge your battery before you go back out there instead of, you know, being just totally on all the time. Can you oscillate and be on and off? Um, yeah. I love that. I love that. I love that oscillation. The mm -hmm. first player I ever saw do that before a game, by the way, was Raul Abanez, one of the one of the greats. And one he's of the, ahead of he was ahead of his time. Dude, what did he play? Twenty plus years? Oh, he was amazing. He, he had, I don't athletic. know him, but he had to have been amazing. Great guy, awesome, just positive as can be, and also just really he got it. He was the first player I ever saw before a game, just go in the corner and just lay down and sort of just do nothing. I said, What were mm -hmm. you doing over there? And he's like, nothing <laughs> and and you know uh, uh, the other side is like players also aren't conditioned to do nothing you always got to be doing something right you're either warming up you're stretching you're in mm -hmm. the hot tanks you're in the cold tanks you're getting therapy you're sitting with the mental guy right there's always something to do mm -hmm. and and this guy understood something different than others where he's like some of that stuff can also exhaust you before the game Dude, so he yeah. took this time out to just recharge like that nap mm -hmm. And it's harder nowadays more than ever with our phones and we have any downtime. We just want to go to our phones. Right. Um, and I think, you know, you tell me if you agree, if we talk about present moment focus being locked in right here, right now, that what zaps our energy the most is our phones and, and not just taking time to recharge with meditation or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that's why as a society, it's hard to really get deep work and focus because we have all these distractions that we all have these kryptonite, which is our phone at times and having an app or whatever you said that you do. Yeah. It's gold, man. You got to, you got to, you got to get out. You got to get out because it'll, 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 you know, it puts you in a heightened, like we, we talked about earlier, right? You said, you know, heightened state of arousal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's good in moments if you use it correctly, but when it becomes chronic, a chronic state of arousal, what do you have, right? You have breakdown, you have, um, you know, your body is just working at higher, you know, emergency levels. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think when, um, sorry to interrupt you. Um, no, it's your show. No, <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, that's where that curiosity we talked about, mm -hmm. um, bringing that flashlight. Okay. If an athlete's man, I just can't focus during the game and all that stuff or go back. Okay. Did you get a good night's sleep? Are you on your phone? What's your screen time? Like all that, like sometimes players just don't ask themselves these questions and then they never get the answers. But a lot of times we all have the answers inside. It's just like, do we sit back and quiet in our minds enough to ask ourselves those questions and then bring that hammer and take action, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think too, you know, it's like there's that fear component of like, if I'm not doing something, mm. should I be? And if I'm not doing something, am I falling behind? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would even ask you, like when you, when you were playing, like how did you know enough BP was enough BP? How did you know enough T work was enough T work? How did you know enough defensive work was enough? Like, how do you know? Because sometimes ball players could become obsessive and they just do too much and they actually, again, have a performance regression. Dude, yeah, been there, been there a lot. Um, yeah, same. Yeah, it, it's a fine line. I think you got to have your your set routines. And then obviously, based on how you're feeling and how you're doing recently, you know, compensate and adjust. But it's that, and I'm sorry, my dog is whining right no, here. No, it's good. Um, <laughs> it's real. Uh, but yeah, um, so just be able to compensate and adjust. But I think it comes down to know yourself and know your strengths. Um, we had, I like to call up there with Mr. Consistency in baseball. Michael Brantley was mm. joined us a couple of nights ago and he talked like he's just a T work guy. And, you know, he has his checklist that he kind of goes through, but he mentioned a couple of times discipline, but he also mentioned, mentioned, know your strengths, double down on those and just really overall self-awareness, just know yourself really, really 
well. Um, so that's what I personally try to do during the, my career is, okay, especially being that platoon hitter, not starting all the time. Um, if I'm going to get a hundred swings in pregame and then a hundred swings into warm up going into the game, my hand speed and all that's probably not going to be there. I'm going to be sore the next day. So that was kind of just through trial and error, um, figure that out as I went along. And, um, I think that's kind of really how most people should try to approach it. Just find, no, there's no the way find, find their way kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. How about now, now that you're not playing, I mean, are you like, what's your day-to-day routine and how, you know, how do, how do you function optimally today? Mm. Yeah. Big, big routine um, guy. Um, So bookends of the day, just really try to be relentless with those, the AM and PM. So as I said earlier, I think the it's, it's our PM that drives the show. It drives everything, drives a good AM. So that I'll start with that, like PM routine, um, have blue blocker glasses I put on an hour before bed. I put my phone in a counter drawer that I can't even see it um, about an hour before bed. Um, try not to eat or drink too late. So that's all about setting up for a good night of sleep. And then I just really, for me, family is huge. So I try to just be as present and connected with them. Um, and all of this just leads, you might not think about it, but leads to a good night of sleep um, and just overall well being. And then for the AM routine, um, really big and taking a cold shower in the morning and doing a light movement and getting some sunlight in and a little bit of movement. Um, and then, you know, optim- what I like to do is with my phone, I, I put it in a drawer away in the morning um, when I feel like I'm most recovered and able to focus. So I try to go an hour and a half of just solid, deep work with absolutely no distractions. Once the kids go to school, just have deep work sessions throughout the day where there's absolutely no distraction. Um, and then try to get, not try, make sure to get move daily movement in, hit up the ice tub every day, hit up the sauna every, just about every day. Um, so these are little things. A lot of it, as you can see, is all about the, is about the physiology, like we talked about earlier, because it yeah. drives so much of our psychology. Um, so those are just kind of a small glimpse into the routines and everything. So a good portion of your day is dedicated to that. Yeah. 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 Every day every day. Oh, I, yeah. Being smart at the same time, not trying to yeah. overtrain. And, you know, with technology out there, like I have the aura ring and whoop band, like they're great and all, but you just got to know your body still, but yeah. I like to track it and have fun with it and um, just be smart, but movement yeah. and, and sleep and nutrition and all that stuff plays such a big role in the mental side of things. And once again, players or we might wonder why things aren't going good for them. And a lot of times I'm glad you brought that up a while back. It's, it's our physical side of things, our physiology, that's going to make it is a huge lever to pull that. I think many athletes don't think of when it comes to the mental side of the game. Yeah. Well, and same again, same when you talk about executives, uh, high mm-hmm. performance and executives in different yeah. fields, you know, again, they feel, they feel they gotta be everywhere. They there's a, there's not a meeting they shouldn't be at. And again, mm-hmm. they, they, they fry themselves out and it's like, it's, mm-hmm. it's almost an obsession that's driving them and they need to hit that break and say, Hey, you know, what? where is my, where is my, where am I physically? Mm-hmm. And then where am I mentally? I find too, uh, in the leadership world, in the corporate world today, uh, there's, there's a lot of talk about the result of poor mental health. Like there's a mental health issue but nobody talks about the physical issue like that could lead to that. you right. You, like we just got done talking about the importance of physiology. How much is a physiology playing into the fact that people are staring at computers all day or that people are not doing walk and talk meetings and not doing these things. Right. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It's um, you know, the one thing you think about ball players and, and athletes, so much of the job, so much of the business is moving. You're always on the move. You're always, there's always physical exertion. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine what the mental state of, of players could be if, if that didn't exist at that level? Yeah. And, and on top of that, like, can they find a way, like, think of your mind as a battery. Can you find a way to, you know, oscillate, be intensely on, but then put the phone away and be intensely off after a meeting, you know, talking about leaders and executives, Find five, 10, 15 minutes to be intensely off too, knowing once again, it's going to pay dividends for you, for the team, for everyone you lead um, down the road or 
that same day or even an hour later is going to pay dividends and just recharge that battery. Um, yeah. Cause then at the end, you're going to get more work done. Yeah. That's why, uh, you know, I want to ask you like, do you believe, cause I think so that energy management is more important than time management. They're both important, but I think the energy part of it is more important. Yeah. Well, I mean, I find that, you know, if you lose, if you lose, uh, if you're not aware of your energy profile, which I don't think a lot of people are until it's vacated, and doesn't and and they realize that they don't have it. I don't have any energy. What do I do? What do I do? And then they you know they claim burnout. Um, mm -hmm. But it but they 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 never had an energy management plan in place. It was burn it, turn it, and burn it, mm -hmm. and and hope that yeah. seven interrupted or four interrupted hours of sleep is the answer. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I work with in in the executive world that they're horrible sleepers. They can't sleep. They have to take, you know, things to sleep. Yeah. And they have constantly interruptions of their sleep. I'm like, how mm -hmm. could you sustain this long yeah. term? And then, and then you need an upper to get through the day. So it's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a crazy situation, but yeah, energy management is, is everything. And here's the scariest thing you got to slow down in order to really think about what you got going on. Mm -hmm. And we're a fast moving society. We're fast yeah. thinkers. We're fast movers. We're fast at everything. And yeah. I mean, I don't know if you deal with this, but I mean, I find myself when I'm on my phone quite a bit or I'm, I'm digitally connected. If I want to sit and like read a book, my brain takes minutes, sometimes 10, 15 plus minutes to actually center itself. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I end up sometimes putting the book down, but for me, it's a trigger to say, dude, way too much time mm -hmm. on, on the devices or connected, you know, you can't have it. It's just so like the norm nowadays. And I heard this a long time ago. It's no measure of good health to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And beautiful, you know, I, I, you, you brought up society and I'm thinking like, you go to the airport, you go to restaurants, everyone's on their phone. So if you're not, and you're just sitting there or you're meditating, you might be looked at as the weird one or you're the, you know, the deviant, whatever it is, yeah. but like, Hey, that it's like, do you want a good mood or do you want a good life? You know, yeah. we got to make that choice. We all have these choice points. And personally, I want to go for the good life. I don't want just the good mood, but you yeah. can have both. If you actually take the time and, and pull the levers needed and yeah. back to what you said, just slowing down, it will help you get those answers. It's, it's true, man. And I, I, uh, as you're, as you're saying that, you know, I, I, again, I, I'm sure as you became a more mature player, you may have realized too, maybe even some of the things you were doing when you were younger that were burning your energy. <laughs> and then as you got older, you said, okay, these are the actual things that I need in order to maintain, sustain, and, mm -hmm. en and enhance performance. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt, especially so sleep. Um, you know, when I, when I traveled, especially early on in the big leagues and even in, in, in the minor leagues, I would, I would just bring a big carry on bag, but no clothes, only food because, you know, big first time, part of my big league career, you know, the nutrition wasn't what it is now. Yeah. Like, a lot of clubhouses have better food nowadays, yeah. but back then they didn't. So I wanted to be in the clubhouse and have something good to go to before a game or, you know, whatever it is, or in the hotel room. So I didn't have to hit up the snack bar. And so for me, you know, that's how, you know, it helped me in my career. Now I know everyone else, other athletes don't have to be um, eating super, super clean, but personally for me, that's what worked best. Um, so, you know, dialing in the, the eating and those fundamentals, how I eat, sleep, um, training the mental and physical side, really prioritizing recovery, yeah. utilizing my breath. Um, I don't know if you notice I'm wearing a wristband. You're, you and yeah. other people are like, why is this, this dude's on the Zoom? Why is he wearing a wristband? But, um, you know, I wore this wristband when I play and I'll show it up here. So I had, you've probably seen players wear these before, um, yeah. but the, you know, when James Mims, who makes these bands like Dusty Baker and Barry Bonds, they all wear them. A lot of players do nowadays. Yeah. Hey, Brandon, what do you want written on it? And before he answered, I just said, breathe, because it was always that thing that helped me get grounded, bring about calm confidence. Um, so the breath is another thing that's going to help um, your physical side as well and mental side. So yeah, yeah, definitely learning curve with all of that.
Yeah, no, this is good, man. All right. I got one last question for you. I I, I call this the becoming a champion show because I feel like we're all on this journey to become our champion self where we never mm-hmm. actually arrive, especially those with high expectations, right? You're always trying to get to that next place. But yeah. um, what does the word champion mean to you? Mm. Great question. And I love what that's all about. Um, champion to me, it means that, I mean, how do I want to wear this? It means an individual who puts the work in and is striving to become that best version of themselves, mm. um, but know that they will never perfectly be that. But if they can know who they are at their best and then consistently have the discipline to do what they know helps them show up at their best, odds are they're going to be a champion in whatever endeavor they have. Yeah. So I like to call it closing the gap who we're capable of being and who we're actually being. You are a champion in my book. If in the moment or just throughout the day, you can close that gap, you're capable of this. And this is who you're actually being. That gap's closed because when that gap is wide, we've all been there and I'm still, you know, not careful. We'll get there. Yeah. Um, Disillusionment, regret, regret, mental health concerns, all that stuff. Cause you're capable of this. You're actually being this. And this is that champion you're talking about. So we can, we close that gap by expressing and living like that best version of us, knowing we're not going to be perfect, you know, um, to, I know I might be going off on a rant here, but that's this good. is that was that's how I used to be. I was this perfectionist with very high standards, thought I should without a doubt hit them all. Now I learned, I think it was Tal Ben Shahar, a positive psychologist, talks about an optimalist. Whereas it's the exact opposite. You have very high standards, but you know you're not going to hit them all. You're going to fall short. So a big thing is I can talk about closing the gap and being that best version of you, but got to know that we're not going to be perfect when we do it, but you'll more and more consistently show up at your best and then be that champion. um, Like what you talk about. Yeah, no, I love it. It, Yeah. And as you're saying that I'm thinking how many people get themselves in a tissy because they have this optimal or this vision of what they want to be yet and and they feel they should be there, but they mm-hmm. they never actually take the actions to close the gap. Mm-hmm. They in their like psych, psychologically they they take action, but they don't actually take the action. I, I've come across that too. So as you mm-hmm. as you put that visual there, I was like, that's stress in itself. I should be here. I'm here. I want to be mm-hmm. here, but I don't do anything to get here. Mm-hmm. Or I do the bare minimum, or I did a little bit today, or I'm inconsistent in what I do, mm-hmm. and I never closed close that gap so and that's where i think discipline is everything do you have the discipline to close the gap and 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 take action because you we all know the book and the movie the secret yeah. that's great you put it out into the universe all that but if you're not taking action it's just going to be that it's just going to be a dream or intention yeah. that you have but without that consistent action that's nothing happens it's true it's true no this was great man i i uh i enjoyed i enjoyed our our chat together so this likewise was, this was cool Bye.